Hello and welcome everyone to a new session of the Nomad Labs Research Seminar. So today we have the pleasure to receive Tom Jack uh, from the LEGO project. So Tom, you're the lead engineer on the LEGO backend. Your focus is on certified programming. And in particular, you have specified the completion path in the Code Proof Assistant and you have proved its type correctness. We've also integrated this path into the LEGO compiler. And if, not, if I'm not mistaken, it will be, uh, the session will be about uh, this effort. So without further ado, uh, let's listen to Tom. And Tom, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so hi, hi. Yeah, I'm here to talk about uh, formally verifying the LEGO backend. Um, I wanna say first, uh, thanks to many different people on many different teams who uh, made my work possible with their excellent work. Um, the legal team and and others, um, obviously Nomadic Labs, many Tesos teams. Um, so thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, to start, I'll give a, a little bit of background. I hope you have some idea um, what Lego is, smart contracts and, and such. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, the Lego, what what the Lego front end, I guess. Um, so. Uh, yeah, we start with um, a, a source program of a, a smart contract, and we have uh, several different uh, three three and a half syntaxes, um, and those are parsed uh, into a a CST for each syntax. And then there are several uh, passes um, that I'm I'm not focusing on. Um, we uh, we purify the code um, into a, a mostly functional language. Um, and then we do some desugaring. And then you can sort of think that this AST core is, um, from my perspective, that's what LIGO is. Um, and there's a, a, a typer, which will type check everything. And this at this point, this is where the, the backend starts. Um, and so then we have some some backend passes, and this is the the piece which I would like to have someday a, a correctness theorem for the whole the whole backend, um, starting from this this AST typed. Um, so the first thing uh, we do is we translate to a language called Mini C, and this is um, purely for historical reasons. It's um, it used to have imperative features, and now it, it has um, only functional features, um, mostly functional. Um, so yeah, the first thing we do is we eliminate um, some features which are not in Mickelson. So modules are compiled to records, and records are compiled to pairs, uh, and variants are compiled to Mickelson's OR type. Um, at the moment, recursive functions are compiled to uh, loops, um, although that may, may change in the future. Um, and uh, yeah, once we do that, uh, we have a translation into a cock intermediate representation. So this is a, a stage which is defined in cock and extracted to OCaml. Um, and this stage is about finding where variables are used, and it introduces a, a kind of relevance discipline. And we'll, I'll talk more about that later. Um, and then finally, there's a pass which takes this cock intermediate representation and emits Mickelson. Um, and I might call this sometimes the compiler, although, of course, the whole thing is, is the compiler. Um, this pass. Um, the most interesting thing it does is closure conversion, um, in some sense, closure conversion using the uh, the apply um, instruction. And besides that, it's mostly about just dealing with this relevance discipline. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, also, I didn't mention there are, there are two uh, important optimizers in in the backend. One of them currently operates on Mini C. Uh, and this one is doing uh, some compile time beta reduction and also eta contraction. Um, so it does uh, what I call inlining 
Um, and there's an example here. Um, if we have an, a, a let expression, we can substitute it. Um, so in some sense, this is a beta reduction, but I call it inlining. Um, and we only do this when it preserves semantics. Uh, so in particular, the expression E1 needs to be pure. Um, and then we also have to worry about the code size blowing up. So we only do this if it's definitely not going to increase the code size or if the user tells us to do this with a, an inlining annotation. Um, and then sort of to go along with that, we have a, a, a beta reduction um, optimization. If we see a, a, an, a lambda, which is applied to something, then we can reduce it to a let. Um, and these are important because every time we emit a lambda in the code, there's some overhead, especially if that lambda closes over other things. Um, and so this helps to uh, smooth everything out. And when things, when we don't emit lambdas, then more optimizations can happen on the on the Mickelson later. Um, yeah, and then less important, but um, we also do eta contraction. If you if you build a record and it just winds up being the same thing, a, a pair, then we just contract it to the, uh, the original record. Of course, again, only if X is pure. Um, yeah, uh, and then. On the Mickelson side, we also have an optimizer. Um, and the perhaps the most important thing it does is it flattens uh, sequences um, because every 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 the compiler will emit many sequences in order to avoid concatenating code fragments. Um, it's just more convenient to to take a code fragment and put it in a sequence so that it's one instruction. Um, but every pair of curly braces costs five bytes in the in the code. So we flatten all those away. Um, in particular, that means we'd never emit macros because every macro has a, has a seek wrapped around it, which is kind of sad, but um, yeah, that's, that happens. Um, another thing, this is not exactly an optimization, but um, the, the compiler has no special handling for fail with or never. Um, and therefore, uh, in Mickelson, you are not allowed to put code after a fail with. Uh, but the compiler will, in some cases, emit code after a fail, fail with. Um, and so we have to go um, delete, delete the dead code after the fail with. Um, potentially, we could avoid this someday with special handling in the compiler. Um, but this uh, works for now. Um, and then finally, there's um, a, a so-called peephole optimizer. Um, it's not exactly like a classic peephole, but it's similar. Um, and at the moment, there's around 30 different uh, rules that we use. Um, some of them are somewhat obsolete due to optimizations in the, the previous stages of the compiler. Um, and some of them are not really that important, but um, here's some some examples, uh, just a, f a few examples. Um, a dig zero, which the compiler will admit is, is the same as doing nothing. Dig one is you save two bytes by just writing swap. Um, if you if you drop something, then assuming that it's pure, we can just eliminate it, um, and you know we will collapse drops into a drop K instruction. Um, and then the current compiler sometimes emits uh, long strings of, of identical digs. And if you have if you have N dig Ns, then it's the same as a, a dug N. Uh, so we also do that. Um, yeah, uh, so my current goal is to prove all of that correct. Um, and I want to do that, I say, a, a mechanized proof. Um, it should be uh, computer checkable, and I'm, I'm doing it in COC. Um, and moreover, I want to uh, extract the compiler from COC um, and integrate it with OCaml. Um, yeah. And then in COC, we'll have some 
statement of correctness. Um, and yeah. Uh, and then someday, um, not yet, but someday I will be interested in manually verifying uh, legal contracts in COC. Um, presumably, we would allow you to put in your, your concrete syntax into into the legal executable and spit out something that you can then work with in cock for some intermediate representation um, but i'm not not there yet um, and then i just want to say um what i'm not doing uh i'm not doing verification of contracts yet only in the compiler um, and i don't ever plan to work on automatic verification of contracts although if you if someone gives me a, a tactic in cock that will use a, a SMT solver, then I will definitely be interested in using it, um, but I'm not, not working on that. Um, and another thing is uh, there are some ideas where we could uh, specify and verify the contract sort of in line. Um, so we write a contract and put, I, either we use a, a dependently typed language maybe, or we put extra specification annotations in the contract um, and so that the compiler itself will verify the contract. It's obviously, that's an interesting idea, but LIGO is not um, a language like that, and I'm not trying to make it one. Um, yeah, so these are all different kinds of formal verification that I'm, I'm not, not doing. Um, OK, so yeah, I want to talk a little bit about um, a kind of big picture, how I am thinking about um, compiler correctness. Um, yeah, so what what is compiler correctness? Uh, I, I really like um, the definition which you can find in the Compsert uh, project. It's uh, I think it's a great definition, but it's also somewhat problematic for us. Um, but the idea is that uh, in, in concert, you'll find very technical um, definitions of simulation relations, things like this. But ultimately, uh, those are proved to imply a notion of preservation of specifications. Um, and intuitive, intuitively, the idea is that if you write a specification of your program in the source language, and then you compile it, you want that specification to still hold for the, the compiled output. Um, and then what is a, a specification? In, in concert, it's any predicate over program behaviors. Um, and then there's the question, what is a, a program behavior? Um, in concert, a behavior, uh, it's a little complicated, but from our perspective, uh, the, the relevant part for Mickelson, um, a program behavior is either it diverges or fails, um, or it returns an exit code. In, in Compsert, there's an, there's an exit code. Um, and then there are things in Compsert for, for side effects, which are not, not relevant to us. Um, but basically, it either diverges or it returns an exit code. Um, and Obviously, that that doesn't work for us, um, quite unfortunately. Um, so there's a question of what what is the the whole program behavior of a, a Mickelson program, um, and I think basically we have to say that it's about um, we, we want to regard a Mickelson program as a, a partial function um, from the inputs, which are the parameter. The initial storage, some things from the environment, um, to the output, a list of operations, and updated storage. Um, and yeah, so it's it's going to be a little bit more complicated, I think, than than Compsert's notion of of behavior. Um, and in particular, it's it's interesting because the the notion of whole program behavior involves uh, a function from Mickelson values to Mickelson values. Um, so then we have to ask, what, what is the behavior of a, a LIGO program? Um, and uh, naively, you'd want to say it's 
again, a function from um, LIGO values to LIGO values. Uh, so we have this question of, in, in concert, the behavior of a program is the same. It's the exact same kind of thing uh, before and after we compile the program. And so we can ask that all specifications are preserved directly. And of course, that's equivalent to asking that the, the behaviors are equal. Um, but in, in our case, uh, we can't directly equate, at least it's, it's not obvious how we could directly equate the behavior of a Mickelson program to the behavior of a LIGO program. Um, we need some kind of um, way to relate LIGO values to Mickelson values. Um, and uh, I'll talk later about some of the actual statements I have so far, which are along, along those lines. Um, there's also in the literature, you'll find notions of um, compositional compiler correctness and also secure compilation. Um, and these are about um, asking, uh, what if we're not compiling a whole program? What if our, our program is going to be linked with other programs? Or potentially, um, for secure compilation, we think of um, we think of compiling a component which uh, may be linked with other code, which could be malicious. Um, and that's intuitively it seems relevant for us in uh, Mickelson because our program will be deployed to the blockchain and then can be interacted with, with uh, by attackers who have implicit accounts or by other potentially malicious contracts. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'll, I'm going to mention a few. Um, so I want to say, I think that we don't necessarily need to think about um, secure compilation and, and compositional compiler correctness because Mickelson is a functional language largely. Um, I think we, we can take this first notion and consider the whole program behavior as a function um, and, and not worry so much about what is compiler correctness really. And ultimately that's what I'll be talking about in a bit. Um, but I want to just hint at um, some potential issues. These are a few a few issues that um, suggest that uh, it's not quite as straightforward as as maybe it seems. Um, so the first one is uh, uh, yes, lambdas are egregiously intentional um, in some sense. That's a a, a quote from um, Benton and in her. Um, so in, in Mickelson, a lambda can be serialized with pack two bytes. Um, and this is extremely strange. Uh, it violates uh, every standard notion of semantics of, of functional language with, uh, you know, with lambdas. Um, uh, so we have to somehow deal with that. And I'll, I'll talk in a bit about how, how we can deal with that. Um, but we might worry about this because if if our contract, for example, transfers a lambda to another contract, even if our contract doesn't serialize that lambda with pack, the other contract might and might behave differently depending on the exact uh, syntactic form of of this lambda. Um, yeah, so that's one puzzle. Uh, another one is uh, we have some transaction environment instructions. Uh, so for example, the amount of the transaction, the sender. Um, and here's a, a, a small example um, where this was actually a, a bug in, in Lego at one point. Um, we have two, two functions. One of them, we get the amount uh, using this uh, somewhat fictional Tezos.amount um, operator. And then we return a constant function, which returns that amount. Um, and in the second case, we have a, a function, which just each time you call it returns the amount. And there's a question of whether these two functions are equivalent. In some sense, it seems like they are. The amount doesn't change during the transaction. So if we're only looking at 
the behavior of the contract in one transaction, um, these seem equivalent. And indeed, we might like to reason about how these are equivalent in order to optimize a contract. Um, but if we put these lambdas in storage or um, transfer them to another contract, then obviously these are very different um, because if, if a lambda becomes mobile and, and uh, arrives at a, a different transaction, then the amount will be potentially different for that transaction. Um, so this problem I'm currently trying to ignore. Um, well, I'll have to deal with it eventually then. Um, let's see. Uh, yes, so another, another puzzle. Um, generally, uh, uh, an interesting point is that the type translation itself from Lego to Mickelson can be become part of the observable behavior of a contract. Um, so, for example, the parameter type of a contract determines how other contracts can interact with it. Um, and if we change the type translation, that will change how our contract behaves in some sense um, to other contracts who are trying to interact with it. Um, and a particular uh, problem that might arise with that is that the, the type translation is, is non-injective. There can be two types in LIGO which are different. You can't cast between them, um, but in Mickelson, they're identical, potentially. Um, certainly once, if annotations are removed, then um, they'll be identical. And you can, even if annotations, even if there are annotations on the type, in Mickelson, you can cast um, between those those types anyway. Um, so here's a, a one hypothetical hypothetical example. If we have two entry points uh, uh, of type A and B, which are different types in Lego, and then we we suppose that we have a a B contract value. If you just use Lego level reasoning, you might think that this B contract cannot point to the foo entry point because it has type A. But if A and B happen to be translated to the same Mickelson type, then in fact, um, it could point to, to Fu. Um, and then an another example, probably worse, um, if we look at the Edo ticket feature where we have values which represent resources which can be possessed by, by a contract, um, we might have a contract which tries to do, use two different kinds of tickets, say representing um, two different uh, access levels, sort of. Um, maybe this, this user ticket gives you permission to do something and the admin ticket gives you permission to do something worse. Um, uh, and in, in Lego, again, these, uh, these two ticket types, because they're, they're different, completely different types, um, you can't cast between them. So it might seem like this, this is okay, but once we compile to Mickelson, uh, these, these two types, both of these two types here, the cred types will be compiled to a just unit. Um, and so any other contract who gets its hands on a, a user ticket can trivially cast it to, to an admin ticket and then send it back to us. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, something to think about. Um, there were other puzzles as well. Um, I just wanted to give it a, a taste, I guess. Um, and now I, I want to sketch, just informally sketch a kind of holy grail um, correctness theorem. What, what I would someday like to prove, it's not what I'm trying to prove right now, um, but someday I would like to, to prove this. And this would hopefully um, deal with those puzzles and any other kind of puzzle that, that could arise. Um, and intuitively ideas, again, we want to preserve specifications or to put it kind of more pragmatically, we want to preserve tests. Um, and so there, there is actually a, a LIGO test language, which is, uh, co somewhat coincidentally very similar to, to my idea here. Um, but, uh, in, generally I'm thinking of, we, we should imagine a fiction where Tezos supports LIGO directly. 
and per perhaps it, it supports both LIGO and Nicholson simultaneously. Um, and then we will have a, a, a meta language, let's say, which um, abstracts over the protocol. Um, you could say that this meta language is just M OCaml um, with the, the protocol um, available, but it will turn out that that's, that's too, um, you, if you just use OCaml with the protocol, you can make too many distinctions. Um, so it, it will be useless in practice. Um, but we want to have some meta language which abstracts over the protocol and just, just lets us write tests that say the things that we care about. Um, so for example, we can originate a contract, pass it some uh, parameter, check the, the result, check the balance of the contract, um, and we can do sequences of, of operations involving multiple contracts and then make assertions about um, the state of the chain after those. Um, and the, the nice thing about this uh, idea would be that the, the whole program behavior of a contract now is simply termination. And, and the, the point is that a contract is not a whole program. Um, the whole program is the protocol. Uh, and so if we have this, this sort of fictional abstraction over the protocol, now we can say uh, that the, the whole program behavior is just, does it terminate or not? And this is an idea you often see in the literature which is not directly applicable to Mickelson. Um, we can just simply say, does it terminate or not? And what we want is that uh, if we write a test that mentions a LIGO program in it, and then we replace that LIGO program with its compilation to Mickelson, the termination behavior of the test should not change. Um, and of course, by termination, I, you could also imagine that there's uh, a, a fail um, it means it terminates successfully um, without throwing an error. Yeah, so this is my sort of informal guide to um, what correctness should mean. And uh, I'm not trying to prove anything like this or even state something like this right now. I might, I plan to try eventually, um, but hopefully any theorem we do prove will, we can judge whether it's adequate by asking does it have any problems which would be revealed if we if we did something like this? Um, yeah, so this is sort of hopefully helps us prove a useful theorem. Um, okay, so yeah, now I, I want to talk about what I've actually done and and what I'm doing. Um, so the first thing is uh, I have a what I'll call a, na a na naive certified compiler. Um, so it's 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 naive in two ways. One, it's a, a subset of Mickelson. It only targets a subset, but it's it's a relevant subset. It has loops, it has failure, it has uh, lambdas as well. Um, and uh, there's a, a fiction where, with regard to the the problem that lambdas are egregiously intentional, that you can pack them. Um, I pretend like that's not true. I'm pretending that. Uh, lambdas are extensional. Um, all you can do with them is uh, exec them. Um, and that allows me to use a, a kind of very standard um, logical relation uh, type relational semantics. Um, and in particular, I have a, a cross language logical relation, which says under what conditions a source program is related appropriately to a target program. Um, another aspect of this compiler which is naive is that the type translation is the identity. Um, I chose a source language which has exactly the same type system essentially as Mickelson, which simplifies things. Um, and I've got some an excerpt of the, the code here. Um, so here's the part of the source language. Um, we have De Bruyne uh, variables. We can have lambdas and we can apply them and so on. Um, we have uh, values and a value of of a lambda type is um, a closure with a body and an environment um, that it, that it's closed over. And then I have an inductive 
uh, evaluation relation. Excuse me. And uh, the only thing I care about is whether an expression evaluates to a, a value. Um, I don't, I ignore uh, the difference between failure and divergence. Um, as far as I'm concerned, if the, if the program diverges, it's the same as throwing an exception um, because it's not going to, uh, the operation will not succeed and the state of the chain won't change. So I, I, to make things simple, I, I just um, only care about successful evaluations to, to a value. So yes, this is the, the source language. And then I have a, a subset of, of Mickelson. I didn't show anything here. Um, but again, I'm pretending that Mickelson has extensional lambdas uh, that can be packed. And because of that, I can use a closure representation also for the Mickelson lambdas, which just makes things a little little easier. Although we'll see that um, you don't necessarily need to do that. Um, and then again, I have an, an inductive evaluation relation um, for, for this subset of Mickelson. And then the interesting part is uh, we have this cross-language logical relation. Um, and uh, it's parameterized by a relation on values, which we'll define in, in, after this. Um, and it says when a source expression is related to a given target Mickelson expression. Um, and there's uh, some trickiness with a uh, calling convention. So I have this Boolean flag. Um, this is to do with Sometimes you want to push an expression onto the stack and leave the environment in place. And sometimes, uh, for example, when you're compiling a Lambda or a whole contract, you need to discard the rest of the stack at the end to return the value. So this flag says which, which one we're doing. Um, and it's mostly standard. Um, we say that uh, the source expression is related to the target expression if whenever the source expression evaluates to some value sy then the target the target program also evaluates to some value ty such that um, those values are related according to the, the value relation um, that's a parameter here and then i also have the the other direction um, needs to be true as well so whenever the target program evaluates to something, then it must be a stack with a, a value um, as, as we would expect. And in that case, the source expression must also evaluate to a value, which is again related to um, the, the target value. And then uh, this, is, this is not important, but uh, after we've done that, then we can define a relation on values, and it's sort of the boring thing you would expect for for most values. Um, a left value is related to in the source is related to a left value in the target if those values are related at the, the corresponding type. Um, and this whole definition is by structural recursion on the, the source type. Um, and then, of course, the the fun part is uh, for lambdas, and we say that a source lambda is related to a target lambda if, for all related arguments, they evaluate in a related way according to this um, logical relation that we defined above. Um, so you, if you plug in related arguments to the source lambda and the target lambda, they must evaluate to related arguments. Um, and this part here is the, the reason that this whole thing has to be by structural recursion on the type because um, it's in a negative position. We can't define this inductively. Um, yeah. So that's the cross-language log logical relation. Then we have uh, the, the actual compiler. This is an, an excerpt. Um, and it's, uh, it's quite boring. It's a little bit naive. Um, but it's uh, extremely straightforward. In practice, you don't want to dip here, um, and you could avoid this. Um, 
but uh, this is the simplest possible thing you can do. Um, and you know, when we're compiling lambdas, we just have a little bit of work to do to deal with um, closure, uh, the uh, applying stuff to closures. And I, I didn't show, um, I guess here in this applying, this is where we would implement, we would emit the uh, apply instruction. It actually builds a, a closure. Um, and then uh, I have a, a proof of correctness. We, we say that correctness holds for a source expression if assuming that it's well typed, then for related environments, um, the source expression is related in the way we just defined to its its compilation. Um, and here's just, just one example um, of how this means that correctness uh, is, is compositional in the sense that correctness for an expression follows from the correctness of its sub-expressions. Um, and with this and a, a couple other lemmas, like the loop, loop case needs a, a special lemma, um, then we can prove correctness by induction over source expressions. Um, okay, I hope that made some sense. <laughs> um, unfortunately, uh, that is not very realistic due to some limitations in Mickelson. Um, the, the issue is uh, that compiler translates the environment to the Mickelson stack directly. Um, and that means especially when people write let storage equals something, let storage equals something over and over again, updating the storage bit by bit. Uh, you can have a, a large environment, which is mostly things that you don't need anymore. Um, and that for technical reasons that increases the gas consumption in, in Mickelson during type checking, and we found that it was, um, we would have contracts which were the same same size or smaller than SmartPy contracts, or which consumed significantly more type checking gas um, due to this issue. Um, and another problem is that there's a hard limit on the total size of the Mickelson stack. That is the, the sum of all the types, the sum of the sizes of all the types on the stack. Uh, and so if you hit that limit, you, you have to, um, there's no way around it. You have to shrink the, the Mickelson stack. And for that reason, uh, we don't actually use a compiler like that in, in Lego today. Um, but we do have a compiler, which is written in cock, uh, a pass, the last pass, which is written in cock and extracts to OCaml and is shipped today in, in Lego. Um, and it's only proved type correct, um, for now I'm working on proving it semantically correct. Um, yeah, and the, this this pass is based on um, Connor McBride's so-called code brain representation, um, which, as I mentioned before, it introduces a kind of relevance discipline. Um, in particular, I apologize, I'll be using Agda um, notation. I hope it's not too confusing. Um, but the, the variable rule for this code brain uh, system says that uh, uh, var has type A if the context only has A in it. Um, and so there's no De Bruyne index here because the idea is that by the time we give a variable, we've said, uh, we've whittled down the context above that so that A is the only thing left. Um, and the way this works is um, we use order preserving embeddings, uh, which means um, for each element of a target list, we say whether we're going to uh, keep it in the, the sub list or we, we can drop it. And otherwise we keep everything in order. And then we have a notion of a covering, uh, which says that two order preserving embeddings together cover the whole target list. And this is the, everybody's got to be somewhere. Um, and the point of this is that um, if a variable is in the context, it needs to be used in some sub expression. It's got to be somewhere. Um, and so we use this, this covering notion, um, which I also call a, a splitting um, to enforce and to, to manage uh, the, the relevance of variables in different sub expressions. So here's an example, um, another example, the, the pair rule, a pair expression has type pair 
if you can split the context into two subcontexts um, in an order preserving way, such that everything in, in gamma has to be in one of gamma one or gamma two, and then you use gamma one and gamma two for the, the sub expressions. Um, and uh, yes, we can we can compile a splitting to Nicholson, but more importantly, we can uh, compile an expression. And the idea here is that we will compile an expression with environment gamma to any Nicholson program, uh, starting with stack type delta one, um, as long as you can find gamma in delta one. And then, uh, so you know, everything in gamma has to be somewhere in delta one, but we're not saying exactly where it can be. It has to be in order. Um, but there can be other things on the stack that we will ignore um, in an arbitrary way. Um, and then uh, everything else in Delta one, uh, everything else in the input stack has to be used, um, has to be left over in Delta two. So the point is this, everybody's got to be somewhere. Um, anything that's on the input stack is either used in the expression that we're compiling or it's left over to be saved for some future expression. Um, and yeah, once you have written this down, the whole compiler sort of falls out um, by just following the types. Um, and this is what's what's currently shipped in, in Lego. Um, okay, quickly, very quickly, I'll, I'll talk about um, what I'm currently working on and what I will be working on soon. Um, at the moment, I'm working on a, a small step semantics of Mickelson um, to be used for proving optimizations correct, the people optimizations. Um, and it will be related to a cross-language logical relation from the previous stage. Um, and expanding on the, the previous idea, um, this version, I have functions and lambdas. It's a, it's a slightly fictional Mickelson where we have an extensional function type and an intentional lambda type, which can be packed. Um, and then um, I won't explain this, but um, it's somewhat interesting in the, in the logical relation. In the lambda case, surprisingly, we don't say just that the two lambdas should be equal to be related. We actually say they should be extensionally related in the same way that functions are, and they should be equal. And if we do that, we can prove the, the fundamental theorem. Um, and yes, what I, what I will do next is use this to port a people optimizer into Coq and prove it correct up to this, this logical relation. Um, and I should have said this is important because um, there was a quote from Arthur once, not optimizing under the bodies of lambdas is a non-starter. Um, so we have to optimize in the bodies of lambdas. And this uh, function type will justify and sort of manage the conditions under which we can optimize under, under the bodies of lambdas. Um, yes. Uh, and then in the future, um, I need to define more cross-language logical relations. They go all the way from a De Bruyne um, intermediate represent representation to Mickelson. Um, currently, the code of representation is emitted by OCaml code. Um, and yes, ultimately, we'd like to get all the way up to the AST typed, um, which is emitted by the typer. Um, and yes, uh, for these optimizations like inlining and beta reduction, I will need to define a logic relation on a, a LIGO intermediate representation, for example, on, on mini C. Um, in order to verify those optimizations in, in COC. Um, and indeed, um, I'd like to improve those optimizations, make them work better. Um, so I part of this will probably be designing a new intermediate representation, perhaps a, some kind of a normal form or CPS joint points, um, something like this. Um, all right, and uh, yeah, that's it. Perfect, perfect timing. Okay, so we're, we've got questions. Um, is the translation from imperative AST to core AST a monadic translation? Um, I, I, I think I want to say no. Um, 
I'm not very familiar with that that piece uh, of the, the pipeline, but um, it's interesting because Pascal Igo, which is the language which has these imperative features, um, it's very restricted. Um, you can only mutate a variable which is in the the immediate lexical environment. Um, and so I, I don't think it's monadic, um, but I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, let's see, I'll move on. Um, could Nicholson optimizations be used outside the LIGO compiler? Um, yes, yes, I, uh, they could definitely. Uh, there are some issues you have to watch out for, um, uh, but they could be. And I, I certainly intend to, in the future, ship them in such a way that uh, they could be um, extracted and shared. Um, but uh, it, it's, it could also be possible to instead target um, Albert or or something like that in, in the distant future. We'll, we'll see. Um, let's see. Do I check that the optimizations actually optimize with respect to the cost model? Sorry, Bruno, did you want to? Yeah, no worries. Um, well, actually, back. you skipped one, but I would suggest that you answer the one that you just read, and maybe I, after I can, I can read the questions. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I so no, no, I I don't check that the optimizations actually improve things. Um, however, each individual optimization almost always decreases the size of the code. Um, I think there may be a few exceptions, but almost every people optimization decreases the size of the code. And that's the main goal. Um, I don't really care about runtime gas at all. I just want to shrink the code size and runtime gas, uh, the total gas cost should hopefully be proportional to that. Um, okay, maybe I should uh, start reading the questions. But first, uh, let's just uh, thank you for your uh, very exciting talk. And, and, and yeah. we can see we have a number of questions on the chat that uh, is very interesting for the crowd. Um, so one other question was about, uh, so how are the recursive functions compiled into loops and do you use CPS? Um, CPS. Hmm. I think I think it might um, I think it might be CPS again. That's a part of the code that I'm not very familiar with. I intend to eventually move that into the back end. Um, actually, I want the previous IR, the previous stage, right before Mickelson, to support recursive functions. Um, and yeah, I, th I think it it might be something like CPS. There's no CPS stage, but the implementation of compiling recursive functions, I think, does have continuations. Um, okay, so the next question is: uh, Could you deal with the Tezos amount, Tezos dot amount problem by doing some effect in France, or else by refining the translation from the imperative AST to the core AST? Um, yeah, I think I think effect inference is is probably relevant, um, and I think there's some plan to eventually have an effect system in in Lego, um, but I'm not sure how to deal with it in the in the semantics yet. Um, my best guess is that in the logical relation for functions, I will have a, a special case which says that functions also depend on the environment in a, in a sort of separate way from the way that expressions depend on the environment. But yeah, I think effect inference will definitely help there. Okay, and thank you. So another question uh, is, can't you cast in LIGO uh, using inline Michelson? Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, and I I, uh, I didn't talk about inline Nicholson at all. That's another interesting puzzle on its own, um, and it has implications for the the way the compiler is designed. Um, in particular, you can you can write anything in the inline Nicholson, and we will pass it along as is, even if we have no idea what those instructions are. 
Um, but yes, absolutely, you can you can test in the go. So you can run your consumer. Um, so perhaps that problem is is solved in in that case by by including the Mickelson semantics into the, the legal semantics. Um, okay, so next question. Um, what do you mean by making too many distinctions when using OCaml as a meta language? Right, right. Um, so a, a good example, and I worry that this might become unavoidable someday. Um, the the OCaml code that uh, the, like apply.ml, for example, OCaml code which lives there, it can look at the exact uh, syntactic form of the, the contract. Um, it, can, it can, for example, assert that the contract has a particular script hash. Um, and as a, if you think about a simpler example, which is uh, correctness of a Mickelson optimizer, if the observable behavior of the contract includes its script hash, then you can't optimize anything. Uh, so the semantics will be trivial and, and useless. Um, so we want to be able to make the distinctions that we care about with respect to an optimizer or a compiler, um, but not so many distinctions that um, we, can't, we can't do any optimizations, for example. Um, and if you think about compiling LIGO to Mickelson, it's not clear what it would mean even to, you can't preserve the script hash if it's written in a different language. Um, but it should be something like OCaml, basically, some s simple subset of OCaml. Okay, thank you. So another question. So could you explain how the cross-language logical relation differ with a simulation equivalence? Uh, hmm. uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. Um, there, uh, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think I can. Um, they're, they're quite different. There might be some way to relate them, um, and I, I would be interested in simulations. I just haven't managed to make them work. And if you look at Compsert's simulation relations, um, they're quite uh, technical. Um, and I and personally, I just don't know how to work with them. I'm, just more familiar with with logical relations, um, but it it could be an, an alternative approach. Um, but I don't know enough to say um, okay, no how they differ. Um, Sorry. Okay, I have a um, a question. So about um, well, I have a couple of questions, but the the first one is we so you. Are you aware of Mishokok? Would it make sense for you to use Mishokok as a backend somehow? Or uh... yes, uh, yes. So I'm aware of Mishokok, and I'm pretty um, familiar with it. Um, and I'll, what I'll say is, I, I would, I'm definitely at least interested in relating anything I do to Mishokok someday. Um, and conceivably, we could even target it as a as a backend someday as well. Um, there are some issues that are interesting, like we have inlined Nicholson, which can be arbitrary, um, and we also uh, we support um, through inline Nicholson and also through a sort of table of predefined instructions. Um, which are completely, they're in raw Michelin. Um, we support, uh, the compiler is very flexible so that when a new protocol comes out, you can, you don't have to change Ligo to, to test it generally. Um, you can use new instructions um, by just using inline Nicholson or something. Um, so if we have a Mishokok backend, you'd have to go and fork Mishokok presumably um, or, or just make it more generic in the first place. Um, but it, it could still be interesting, yes. And certainly, like I said, I, I would like to prove some relationship between my semantics and, and Misha Kark, at, at least. Um, yeah. OK, uh, thank you for your answer. Um, so actually, I think there is no more questions from the uh, audience. 
So maybe it's time to uh, wrap up the session. So uh, Tom Jack, once again, thank you very much for your talk uh, and for your many replies. Uh, thanks everyone for attending and for your questions. And we'll see you in two weeks for another seminar. And in the meantime, take care. Bye-bye.